we're good to get started. Thanks, everyone, for uh, being here today. This is the course, right? To make sure we're all both in the same place. Everyone here and me. Cool. For those that weren't here for my uh, pre-announcement, so I am uh, I lost my VGA to USB-C adapter, so I am presenting off this screen to what you're seeing here, and I'm recording off of this screen, so I'm going to try to keep them in sync. But there may be weirdness just for those of you who are watching online. So good afternoon, I guess, since it's technically right afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here and not being at lunch. Uh, this is Introduction to Information Assurance, CSE 365. As you may know, this course 365 is um, new at this level, at the 300 level. Um, it used to be a 400 level course. I'll talk about why we made that change in a little bit. Uh, but first, I'd like to introduce myself to you all. Has anyone here taken a class from me? Ooh, only one of you. Oh, you guys are in for a fun surprise. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Three counts. Okay, so I'm Adam Dupe. I did my PhD at UC Santa Barbara. I actually have all three of my degrees from UCSB. I did undergrad there, and then I did their equivalent of a four plus one program, so I got a master's in an additional year. After that, I said, I am so tired of academia, I am gonna go work and make a lot of money. So I had a full-time job at Microsoft as a soft, uh, an SDE, a software developer engineer. And I was there about a year before I realized I really missed doing research and doing kind of crazy, cool, novel things that nobody's ever done. So I went back to UCSB for my PhD. After I finished that, I ended up here at Arizona State University, where I've been for now, I guess, four years. This is my fifth year. Wow, I feel real old. So my research is on basically all kind of areas of system security, so trying to understand and analyze the security of a system to build systems to solve security problems. Uh, my PhD was on automated web vulnerability analysis, so how can you create tools that either analyze the source code of a web application and say there's a possible cross-site scripting vulnerability here, or black box tools that have no idea about source code and you just point them to a web application and say find me all the vulnerabilities. Um, since then, I've, I've expanded into a lot of areas. I'm interested in Android security, SDN security. Uh, really, if it's cool, I'm, I'm kind of into it. Um, I'm also a big uh, capture the flag player. So I started playing capture the flag, and that's actually really how I became, honestly, a security professor, is I took a, um, an undergraduate security course with a professor at UCSD. He invited me to join their hacking team, and then from there, it kind of snowballed into doing research with him, doing a PhD. Um, but I, so, uh, for those that don't know, so capture the flag contests are essentially you can think of them as little puzzles. So it's like a security puzzle that you have to solve, usually in the form of a program. So they give you a program. There's some intentional vulnerability, which is the puzzle aspect, and then you have to analyze the program, find the vulnerability, write an exploit that steals a flag that you shouldn't be able to capture, and then you deliver that flag to the game organizers as proof that you actually broke that service. Um, so I started playing my CTF days with uh, UCSB's team, Shellfish. They're one of the top teams, I think they're probably top 20-ish in the world. They won uh, the Olympics of hacking in, I think, 2008, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, I want to put this out here. there. Uh, we're actually under the, so I'm the like faculty leader of the group, the Pwn Devils. Um, they have student presidents, vice presidents, and everything. Uh, they're organizing a really big introduction meeting actually today at 4 p.m. So if any of this stuff already, you're wondering how can I get into more hands-on security stuff, this is the way to do it. So we actually have a meeting tonight, and then we have our first CTF that we're playing in this weekend, which is super cool. So it's open to everyone at all skill levels. Um, the current president, Will Gibbs, he started, uh, he joined the group when he was a freshman and knew literally nothing. And then he learned on his own, and then after a year said, I want to make this a student group. And I said, OK, do it. He drafted a, comp uh, a constitution, and now it's like an official student organization that he runs. Um, so as long as you're willing to put in the time and the effort, really anyone can get into this security stuff. Um, and this is the website, which I'll try to click through right now, which definitely is not going to work. Yep. OK, since I'm on a different computer. 
I have no idea what's going to happen when I do this. That's my Dropbox. I'm awesome. Awesome that that's on there. Cool. So you can come here. You can learn about our meeting times. We have a mailing list. We have a Slack. If you have an ASU email, you can just join our Slack. Come out, say hi. Uh, we have some do some really cool stuff, and we also have what I actually really like here. Uh, Will created this how to hack page, which talks about binary exploitation. So it kind of walks you through some of the basics. It even has a working uh, stack layout, which is cool. All right. Any questions on that? What a question for you. How do I? That's not what I want. Cool. Any questions? You have to be scared. We're going to be together for 15 weeks, so we might as well get to know each other. Have yes. There, have there been any seniors who have taken this class? This class? Yeah. Well, technically, this class is brand new, so no, because uh, 365 has never been taught before. So it used to be 465, and so a lot of the material and content is going to overlap significantly with 465. Um, but it'll be a little bit, I won't say watered down. It's not won't be quite as difficult. Like the difficulty won't be insane. Um, so it'll be should be appropriate for your level. But you know, this is something I could use feedback on. Cool. And now I'd like to introduce our awesome TA, Ferris. You want to stand up, wave? So you shouldn't mess with Ferris. He spent three weeks in the Turkish army this summer as part of mandatory military service. So he knows how to salute. He knows how to make a bed with no creases. Uh, if you have any questions about that, feel free. Is that true? I didn't ask you that, but no? <laughs> Your bed is creased, man? And wrinkled? OK, cool. So Ferris. No wrinkles. See, no, okay, yeah, no wrinkles, no wrinkles. Um, so Ferris is a PhD student at ASU. He started as a master's student, got involved with research, and then decided to continue on with his PhD. You want to tell people about your research at a high level? Um, I, currently, I'm working on a qualitative research study um, where I conduct uh, interviews with professionals from the industry regarding security operation centers, and I, I analyze those verbal data that I collect uh, to find some conclusions about it. Sort of limitations about the security operations centers. Right, so a lot of organizations have this security operations center where they look at alerts in the network and say, is there like an antivirus alert? Or did one of our intrusion detection systems just alert? And then they need to do something about it. But us as academics, we try to come up with cool, crazy new ways to solve that, but we don't actually know what their real problems are. So Ferris is out there doing interviews with people, uh, essentially labeling the interviews. I don't want to introduce the, yeah, cool. the coding word, yeah, which gets confusing. Um, so Ferris is going to be our TA for this. He's super awesome. He's really into the security stuff. So he's going to be a great asset for everyone. Cool. Questions about Ferris? Awesome. Cool. So I want to tell you about something that just happened last week. So I was part of a team. So when I mentioned Capture the Flag, so DEF CON is a security conference that happens every year in the summer in Las Vegas. Uh, this year, I actually have no idea how many attendees there were this year because I was so out of it. Um, it. There's a lot of people that go, and one of the main events there is DEF CON CTF, so Capture the Flag. And this is an in-person, invite-only, like qualification-based event where we host qualifications in, I think, May, the top this year, the top 24 teams were invited to come to Vegas in person. So teams from around the world, we had an Italian team that flew 40 people to Vegas to play. Um, it was really cool. So I was part of the team that organized this as part of the Order of the Overflow. Um, three of the professors here at ASU, uh, me, Jan, and Tiffany, are part of the order. Um, and we spent literally our entire summer doing nothing but prepping for this game. Uh, because it turns out when you invite 24 of the top hacking teams in the world to play a game, you need to make sure your infrastructure is actually really well done as well. So uh, they did find some bugs in our infrastructure, uh, but luckily they weren't game-breaking bugs and nobody um, was able to break the game that way. Uh, so this is a little picture to kind of give you a, an idea. So even though each of these teams has 40 or 50 people playing, they actually are limited by space of only having eight people. So we were in this organizer table in the middle. There was 24 kind of eight pods of a, a rectangle table where each of the teams would be. We had to lay um, 
Ethernet cable from us to every team, which is absolutely terrible. I don't know if you've ever had to tape down. And then we did it once, and then in the morning, they said the fire marshal was there. Everything needed to tape down three times. So one in the middle and two on the sides, not just one. So then we had to retape everything. Um, it was a very big learning process in terms of doing all of this kind of stuff. Uh, but the teams played for 48 hours total. So it was Friday competition had 10 hours. So it was 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Uh, Saturday, and then after that, we closed down, shut down the game. They all had to go home, but they would continue working on stuff overnight. Um, the next day, 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. again, and then four hours the next day on Sunday. So they played, actually played for a total of 24 hours. Um, and then this was us at the closing ceremonies of DEF CON announcing the winners. So the winners didn't actually know at the end who won. So the third team three through one were all there. And so we announced, and so this is, um, you probably can't, maybe could, it's a good thing you can't see, but I think at this point I'd slept for like nine or 10 hours since Thursday morning, and this was like Sunday at 4 p.m., uh, just fixing bugs in the game stuff. So if you look, everyone up on stage is kind of like out of it a little bit, um, <laughs> and that's why. Uh, but it was a super fun event. Uh, a team from that's composed of academics and industry people, mostly based in Korea, but also in a Georgia Tech a Def Corps route, they won. And so the question is, what proper prize can you give the top hackers in the world? So what they did was one of, oh, this projector's not very good. So you see this uh, badge here uh, that this person's wearing? So this is a, a very special black badge. So the winning team gets eight of these black badges, which means they get free entry to Def, the DEF CON conference for the rest of their life for winning this event. So, and that's, you get bragging rights, and you get this, and you get nothing else. And that's to, um, to uh, thank you for, your, for playing. Uh, so it's actually pretty, it's pretty crazy, pretty incredible. Uh, they were really stoked, and they were really good. So you talk about like top team, like they submitted I think 500 more flags than the second place team or something insane like that. Like they are insanely good. Cool, any questions on this? So I'll give you guys a little background about what I've been up to this summer. Questions? Wait, do, you come, do these teams come from all over the world? Yep. So our qualification event was open to everyone. We had 600 teams play, and that was 48 hours straight. So we started that on a Friday, ended on a Sunday, and teams from all, of the, all, all over the world played. The top 24 were invited to come to DEF CON to play in the finals. Yeah? So what was it like, uh, so like your role is like the ASU team to set up It's like organizing, yeah. So our role, our role was not just organizing, but creating each of the puzzles, right? So it's be like, I don't know, I'm trying, it's just, sports analogies aren't great. We're part, um, they're officials, because whatever we say goes, if we say like, at one point teams were making too many requests to the network, so we started unplugging their cables and saying, you guys need to turn down your scripts, otherwise we will just cut your cable completely, right? So we're part referees, but at the same time, it's like uh, building kind of like an obstacle course in some sense. Like we have to build it custom from scratch so the teams don't know what's coming. Uh, all of the services are written like 100% from scratch. So it's not like we don't take something like Chrome and be like, okay, now home Chrome, right? <laughs> it's like we create this puzzle that has one or more vulnerabilities that we intentionally put in and then they have to analyze usually at the binary level, reverse engineer it, identify the vulnerabilities, and then launch exploits at all the other 23 teams to steal their flags. Any other questions? Cool, and I'm on the hook for this for like <coughs> two more years at least, so next time I'm gonna sleep more. Okay, so before we get started, I wanna introduce you to all the cool security stuff we have at ASU because students uh, constantly are coming to me saying, hey, how can I get involved with security? So one good way is the Pwn Devils. Um, I don't think I mentioned it, but a lot of the students will go to those meetings, go to capture the flags, play, learn, and then go out and get jobs like in the real world. So we have students that got jobs at the NSA um, and other 
government organizations that now they can't tell me what they do. Uh, but it was really because they said that they played these capture the flag games. Cool. So we have actually, ah, yes. Okay, we have two undergraduate cybersecurity concentration programs. This is a new thing. Well, the new thing is the name. It used to be information assurance. Now it's cybersecurity. What this concentration means is it goes on your degree that says you have a concentration in cybersecurity. Um, we have this at the BS level and the BSE level. And I believe, there we go. So we have three graduate programs, MS, MCS, PhD. You can find more about it at this link. That's slightly out of date, but that's fine. So the BS concentration, the idea is you take 13 credits in cybersecurity areas and related areas as technical electives. The good news is you're already taking the intro, like the first class in that series. So 365 is now a required class for all the other courses. You take this, the purpose of this course is to give you a broad overview of all the areas of security. So then at the 400 level, you can choose to drill down into areas that you're interested in. So some of those courses are 466, uh, computer system security, that's gonna be a really awesome class this semester. 467, 468, data and information security, network security, uh, computer network forensics. We also, I believe, have a number of 500 level courses that you may be able to take as an undergrad, but talk to your advisors because I don't know how that works. I just know what the courses are, very roughly. Any questions about the concentration? Yes? I'm currently signed up for 466. Mm -hmm. Is that, is the prerequisite still this class or is there not really a prerequisite? It's a great question. Do not know. <laughs> it sh should be there, but maybe because it's the first time we're waiving that, especially for, I think it'll be a, it's probably a prereq for all the freshmen that are starting now. Okay. So that when they go through, they know when they need to take it, right? But it's not fair to change that to people who are already through. So I think you'll be fine yeah, you'll be fine doing both. 466 is going to be a fun class. Cool. Okay, and the other thing about, so part of this, uh, whoop, part of, ah, uh, they're desynced. Oh gosh. Okay. So part of um, why we have this concentration is that we are an NSA and DHS designated, like they designate, they look at our program, they look at all the courses we're teaching and the content of those courses, and they designated ASU a National Center of Academic Excellence in Information Assurance Education. So these are like from these two, so this is two certifications, one from the NSA, one from DHS. All right, now to class stuff. Let's see if I can click. This is gonna be the difficult part. This should not take us too long. I want to actually get to stuff today. Sorry, I rarely use a Windows computer, so I feel a little out of it. Paste and go. There we go. And I gotta do it on this one. Awesome. Okay. So syllabus, we will be announcing by Tuesday. Ferris and I need to sit down and figure out uh, office hours times. So as office hours times, we will be there unless we give usually at least 24 hour notice of being out of town or something. Um, so we'll make sure you have enough office hours where you can come to us and ask questions. Let's see, I'm trying to find a new, wait, why is this? I don't know, everything's weird, okay. This has the wrong one. I know you can't see this, but trust me, it's wrong. If you watch on the video, you'll see it. Okay, here, syllabus, good. Okay, cool. I usually have used in the past a Google group for course communication. I like having a place where all of you can ask each other questions, because if you look at this classroom, there's at least 132 of you, and there's two of us. Right, so that scale is tipped very much in the student's direction, so uh, this is a kind of help yourself course. The problem is last semester when I taught 545, uh, apparently Google Groups does not properly block spoofed email addresses, and so somebody sent a email message to the Google Group 
as me saying that the midterm was going to be an open note, open book midterm <laughs> the day before the midterm, which is, as you'll notice in the, the syllabus, is completely not true. Um, so I no longer, I actually, I don't know if I should say this, but I, I know people who work at Google and I sent them very ang angry messages being like, why does your crap product allow you to do this? Um, <laughs> it should be blocked. Sorry. So, uh, so I will set up something else. If anybody has something that they've used in the past that they love, I do not like Blackboard. Uh, I'll say that now, though I guess we're retiring it. I usually, uh, if anybody has any good news, I've heard Piazza's good or Moodle are good. I may experiment with one of those this semester, but wait, we'll see. Wait, did you say you're retiring Blackboard? Uh, I think so, yeah, at some point. Even a Canvas. Yeah. Yeah. Canvas. Canvas. I, like to usually use my own thing that is simple rather than a complicated enterprise -y type thing. That's just my thing. So uh, if you have suggestions, feel free to shoot them my way. I'd be happy to, to think about that and to use that. Cool, okay, so the entire idea, as I mentioned, the idea of this course, it's going to give you a, an overview, and is this still too small for people to read in the back? I think the answer is yes. I don't know. I think that's good. Great. So the idea is security is incredibly multifaceted and really um, complex. Yes? Uh, where can we access the syllabus? The syllabus is online right now at my website. I haven't posted it on the, the link on whatever my ASU is. It'll be there soon. Uh, if you want to go here, you can go to so you can go to my website, teaching, classes, the link is here. Uh, this will be our main form of communication is this website. I will update it. I will try to, as you can maybe see right now, I'm, I try to record all my lectures and post them online. I do not make any, absolutely any guarantees about that actually happening due to technical reasons. I will try my best to make sure that it happens, but whatever, if the recording fails, I'm not going to re-record a whole class just for those people who weren't here. So it's kind of up to you. I do it as a way so that you all don't have to sit there writing down every single thing I say. You can go back and review the lectures kind of on your own time. Uh, but in general for my courses, you're all adults. I expect you to act like adults. If you don't want to show up to a course you're paying for, I don't care. So I'd like you to be here because we'll have awesome discussions. Um, but if you choose not to be here, that's on you. OK, any more questions or how to access this? How, wait. So you say we're uh, going to be moving to campus? No, no, that's a whole university thing. I'm not doing that. Cool. Okay, so the idea of this course, as I mentioned, we will go over all types of areas of security. So the part, so the parts that I really like of identifying vulnerabilities in systems, exploiting those vulnerabilities, we will cover. We're also going to cover all really important things such as policy. So how do you, as an organization, ensure that your security controls are happening. Um, we we'll talk about ma management, legal aspects, so we'll touch on um, the legal side of things and especially ethical side of security and of hacking. Um, questions on overview? We'll touch on crypto too, web. We'll do a kind of very broad overview. Questions? Are we gonna be looking at hyper Infrastructure as well. Or Say that again. Hyperconverged infrastructure. I don't know what that means. Uh, so instead of having like a bunch of different servers, they're all moving kind of to one platform. We will. We're going to look at security. Basically, what I want you to take away from this course is to be able to think with a security mindset. So to be able to analyze any system for possible security flaws and security vulnerabilities, and to also think about the threats to that system. So you should be able to apply, so this is, for a lot of the courses, we want you to apply what you're learning here to any context. So you can answer that question when your boss says, hey, we're looking at merging, we're switching from a VM-based solution to now a Dockerized container-based Kubernetes cluster. And so then you could think through, what does the business need, what threats do are we worried about, and how does that change in this new environment? Uh, what policies and mechanisms do we need to put in place to make sure that we don't have any problems? Um, so that's really what, rather than focusing on any one technology, we're going to do kind of a broad overview. But we will get, you know, 
I mean, we'll talk about security vulnerabilities, uh, buffer overflows, rock, those kind of things. And so we will go deep into some tech. Um, but yeah, the skills should be transferable. Uh, we are, you know, you can take security courses to get a certificate that you know how to run something like Nessus or Nmap or something. Um, but we're trying to teach you how to think like a security professional, right? So that you can be the person developing the tools, not the person just using the tools. Okay, prereqs should be easy. I don't think you could take this course without having these prereqs. So they're there. Uh, the textbook, so I like to do pretty much uh, every, all the material that you need in this course will be provided in lecture. Uh, you'll get the recorded lectures, assuming they work, as long as the lecture slides. Um, I do recommend this book. This book is a good resource if you're a person who likes having multiple pieces to draw from. I highly recommend getting this Introduction to Computer Security. On the front page of the website, I will map all of our course content to sections of this book so you can review those and see kind of how they map with what we're talking about here. All right, does that make sense? Cool. Okay, so the course mailing list will be TBD. It will be to be decided. I will let everyone know when we have one. Um, I cannot recommend, if you have not read this, um, this, I guess, article on how to ask questions the smart way, you should read it. And if you've already read it, you should reread it. And if you've read it enough that you've memorized it, you should probably read it just one more time. Uh, this is an incredibly good way of describing how to get a good answer from somebody. So oftentimes I've taught, has anybody taken 340 yet? Yeah. Or is it in 340? Yeah, I get, when I taught 340, I would get emails from students being like, my code doesn't compile. <laughs> and I want to help you. I want, I fully believe all of you can walk out of this class with an A, right? You put in the work, you do good on the assignments, you can get an A. I want to help you. If your code's not compiling, I want to help teach you why it's not compiling. But if you just tell me it's not compiling, that's not enough information for me to go off of, right? So what this document describes is how to phrase your question in such a way that it's likely to be answered, right? Of saying, wow, I'm getting this really weird compile error. It looks exactly like this. I Googled this error message. I found these, these stack overflow uh, questions. I, none of them really respond to what I'm trying to do. I've tried X, Y, and Z. I've tried commenting out this line. I've tried changing this thing to public from private. Still nothing is fixing this error and I can't understand why. Right, so like one question or one question is just like, hey, give me help. The other one is saying, hey, I'm super stuck and here's all the information you need and here's everything I've tried to get unstuck, right? We have limited time, you know, I've love to spend all of my time helping all of you. Uh, but with limited time, we prioritize people who it's very likely we can help. And we can say, ah, I see exactly the problem. You tried you know, this, this, and this. You give me enough information to do that. That said, don't just throw your source code at us and expect us to fix it, because that's technically all we need to reproduce your, your errors. Um, so just be, be cognizant of when you're asking questions. And this applies not just to us, but also to the mailing list, too. Uh, because you should be asking you know, your fellow students when you get stuck. And getting answers to those questions is kind of an art in and of itself. So I highly recommend to read this document. Any questions on asking questions? Don't worry, I won't take off any points if it's not great. Yes? Um, so what's the website? The website, if you go to uh, adamdupay.com, you can go to teaching. There's a teaching link, and then that'll show the classes, and then there'll be a link to this page. Um, I'll also be posting this as soon as this is over on the, what is it, the course? I don't remember the thing. It's For me, it's on my ASU, and I just post the syllabus link. Okay, cool. Okay, I will create an address, a specific email address that you should use for all communications to us. One of the most annoying things, has anybody, well, probably not, but one of the most annoying things that can happen is if a student emails me and the TA, and then the TA answers it, and then I'm going through my email and I spend time to answer it, and the student's like, oh, the TA already fixed this for me like three hours ago, right? So making sure we're included on communications, I'll give you one email address to use. It'll be, probably be something uh, very simple to use, and that way, 
it'll be useful for everything. Um, so that's like a good thing. So the, at a high level, these are roughly the course topics we'll cover. Uh, we'll talk about security objectives, mechanisms, attacks, and threats. Uh, we're going to do, you know, I, I know you can watch this course online. I like having students in here so we can have discussions. We'll have, I will propose scenarios and we'll talk through what threats are appropriate to this scenario. Um, and so it really helps to have people in here who are willing to contribute to the discussion because uh, I think that's the best way to kind of learn and reason about security is thinking through these things. Um, so we'll cover everything, access control, crypto, authentication, network security, web security, system security, policies, management, risk assessments, assurance, privacy, anonymity, legal and ethical issues. All right, questions on that? If it's something you'd really like to see, shoot me an email, let me know. Um, I can't guarantee we'll get to it, but we'll all try. Yeah. Are we going to be doing threat modeling? Or yeah. Try or something? What? Say it again. Stride. Stride methodology. Threat modeling. Are we going to do Possibly. I, I like to teach things more at a high level rather than a specific methodology of doing things, but we definitely talk about here's the scenario, what are the threats, which ones are relevant for this specific organization and this business, which all apply directly to this. Um, Cool. And the other thing I will say about somebody who took 465 last time I taught it, I think it was in about two months or maybe a month and a half into the course, he came in and sat down and, and said that he just had an interview with a security company and like the three questions they asked him were like three things we talked about in class like the first or second week. So, you know, I will do kind of two things. We learn kind of the high level thing. We also, and I teach you the important things about security that security professionals expect you to know. We'll also do low level, so there will be coding and there will be hands on exploitation things in this class. So this is not just a high level course, but this is also kind of a low level, get your hands dirty, write code, hack, break stuff. All right. We will have between three to six homework assignments. It's a broad range so that depending on how things go, we can have more that'll cover all the topics. Um, there'll be a midterm and a final exam, just in case anybody tries to spoof me you know, leading up to this. You can be assured that all of my exams are always closed book, closed computer, closed nothing, you, your brain, a writing instrument, and that's it. Okay, so grading, 60% homework, 20% midterm, 20% final. So homework is rated a lot because it takes time, it takes effort. I expect you to put in the work and do it. Any questions on the breakdown? It does add up to 100, right? You all check that. Otherwise, that would suck. You can only get 90% or something. <laughs> all right, thresholds for grades. So this is... What I say is these are the, uh, I will never curve, let's say, lower than this. I might decide, depending on your grade distribution, to say, wow, maybe 89% should be an A minus. But I won't ever go up. I won't say, now the, the cutoff for an A minus is 95%. So you can be rest assured through the course, you're calculating your grade. If you're in these ranges, these are the grades that you're going to get. Is that good? Fair? It's not a lot of questions. Should I be worried by that? Are y'all going to drop? <laughs> Taking it in, that's cool. I like that. All right. Okay. The, my late policy, so homework due dates and exam dates are posted well in that will be, you will know about them well in advance when the assignment is given. Um, for assignments, basically, you can choose to be late. I'm totally fine with that, but every day that you're late is a 20% reduction in your overall score. So that means that if you, let's say, submitted 100% uh, of the assignment a day later, or even 10 minutes after the deadline, that's considered not on time, so that's a 120% deduction. So if you submit a 100% project, that's an 80%. If you do it on the second day, it'll be, so it stacks, so it'd be 60%. 
Um, we will take your highest submission of all of your submissions. Does that make sense? And you will know your grade when you submit your assignments, except for written assignments, because that doesn't make sense. Yes? Uh, when's the deadline, typically, for the homework, time-wise? Oh, oh time-wise, usually midnight, 11.59, uh, Arizona time. The day depends on kind of when the assignment's given, when I think it's fair. I don't know, I think it's really difficult because some people want to do it like on a Friday at midnight or Thursday at midnight so they can just get it done. The one thing I can say I will never do is have a deadline the day before class usually, um, like a Monday or Wednesday because then nobody shows up to class because they were all cramming for the deadline. Um, yeah, I don't know, we'll play with it. Yes? Going back to what you said before about yep. the highest submission counts. Is that essentially, if you have part of it done, you should submit it anyway? Yeah. Yes, so you'll have, I'll, I will try to be, this since it's a, I guess a 300 level course, I don't know. There, it's a bit of a trade off, right? I don't want people to just make a change and then just resubmit without doing their own testing, right? So you shouldn't be using the testing system as an oracle to tell you when you fixed your bugs. <laughs> right, which definitely happens. And with a lot of you, it starts jamming up the queue of grading. Um, so what I like to do instead is to, um, uh, what I like to do instead is to cap it at something usually absurdly high, like 20 or 25. That can give enough. I still, people run out of that somehow. I, you know, it's, so you, there will be some kind of limit just to prevent, so to force you to think. Yes. Highest point total submission, including late. Oh, including yeah. So if you submitted one before the deadline, that was 84%. And then afterwards, you submitted something that was passes everything, all the test cases, but with the deduction is 80%, your grade would be 84. Yeah? So are these going to be turned in on, on your website, or is it going to be I will, Blackboard? I will post the link. No, absolutely. There will be no Blackboard for this course. None. It's going to be the website. There'll be a submission website as well. So it'll be my website, submission website, and some kind of course discussion thing. But you will all know about it, trust me. I will force you to. Cool. It's going to be fun. Do you typically return exams, or do you have people go to office hours to discuss them? That's a great question. <coughs> to be honest, I don't remember. <laughs> So I do different things in my undergrad and graduate courses. So I don't want to make any claims without reviewing what I did in the past. You will know. I mean, you'll be able to see. Yeah. OK, yeah, good. OK, any, if anybody needs any special accommodations, I'm very happy to do that. I've done it in the past. It works out really well. Um, so just contact me. Let me know through the DRC, and we'll work everything out so that everyone gets their fair accommodations. OK, now the part where I need to be really scary. Have I been scary yet? Yes. Yeah. Yes? OK. <laughs> now I need to be even scarier, but I don't know how. OK, so uh, plagiarism. Uh, so on, I mean, I'm kind of of two minds. So on one hand, I mean, you're paying for this course. So if you want to pay for zero and cheat your way through to an A and get a degree, and go out in the world and somebody asks you about what are the three important aspects of security and you can't answer, uh, that's kind of your fault because you're never going to get that job. Uh, on the other hand, I hate it when students put in a bunch of work, get like a B, and then a student who cheats gets an A. And I think that's really not fair to the students who put in the time and work. So uh, I am very strict and very harsh on plagiarism and cheating. Um, so I have reported to the, um, I believe it's at the dean's level, the dean's office, every instance of plagiarism that I've detected in all of my courses, undergrads and graduates. I think at the bottom it says how many. Twenty-seven. A little bit out. Uh, yeah, 27. So I've done this 27 times. I know how to do it. I'm not afraid to do it. Everyone has a sob situation and sob story. <laughs> but it's still not fair to the rest of the students, so I'm looking out for all of you who are putting in the work so that your A in this class is actually uh, worthwhile as an A. Um, so you are, so 
What does plagiarism and cheating mean in a course? You've all read the student handbook, so I'm sure you're very familiar with it. especially from a fellow student in class. So I have an exception that you have here. I was a professional developer. I do know in the real world that you, to, I still do, I do it now. When I Google for something, and some, there's some code on Stack Overflow that fixes it, I copy and paste it. In this course, right, um, what we want to make sure is that you include a comment in your source code just of where you found it, which is actually a good practice to do anyway, software engineering wise. So if somebody goes and sees that code, they can know, oh, you took it from this thing, and maybe there was an update or maybe something um, fixed that. So you can, you're free to use snippets and stuff you find online. If you are stumbling around online and you happen to find a CSE 465 solution to assignment one, right, that would not count as like an acceptable <laughs> copy and paste, right? But if you're like, how do I reverse a function in Python and you find something, that's totally fine to use, right? So I think the, the differences are very clear, or are fairly clear, right? Um, so yeah, using another student's code, even past students, present students, uh, is, an, is a violation of the academic integrity policy. And we have all the past submissions, we run everything against them. These are easy things to check. Yes? Um, so what, what do you we'll get to that later. Um, yeah, I believe, yeah, we'll, we'll discuss that when we get a little bit closer. Cool. And as I mentioned, zero tolerance policy, which means that every in violation of the academic integrity policy is reported to the dean's office. Um, I've done this 27 times. I don't want to do it anymore, so please like, do not make me increment this number, but I will do it if I have to do it. And you know, it, this is something that can be tough, and I understand, right? You're coding, it's 11 p.m. on the deadline. You've been coding for the last like, 24, 48 hours and it's still not working, and it's very tempting to just take something from one of your friends and just use it. It's very easy to detect, and it causes a lot of pain later on. So it's much better to just take the lumps, take the 70% or whatever, and know that you didn't cheat. And that's very good. So some examples. Sharing code with fellow students. You know, don't use other people's code in this class. I mean, that's an easy way we can, we can all stay safe. Um, submitting another student's code as your own, that's clearly not good. Submitting a prior student's code as your own, I don't know if you're aware, but we can retroactively change grades and issue like academic integrity violations, even to students who've graduated. And then they actually have to come back and retake the course. I don't want to do it, so don't do it. I know none of you will, I'm just, this is just what I have to say and do, right? Uh, okay. So the other thing that students tell me, and this is something I partly sympathize with, is that uh, do not post your code publicly accessible online for your courses. Um, I had one instance, the first class I taught, where somebody submitted an assignment late, got full credit, it matched with another student, and then we, it was actually two students matched with one student, and so I had to call them all in, write them all up, the first student, foolishly, and this was before I had this, this comment in here, posted their code online on GitHub right after the deadline. And the other students somehow found it and used it and submitted it as their own with making, you know. And so, so this includes working out of a public GitHub repo. So you want to use Git to develop? I love it. I fully support it. You should do that. Use the GitHub student pack so you have unlimited private repositories. You can all go get that now as ASU students. So there's no reason to make your repo public. The second thing that students tell me is I want to have a public repo for my course assignment so that I can impress potential employers. 
I, I hate to tell you this, or maybe I should be telling you this, so I don't really hate it, but I mean, I, I went on recruiting trips for Microsoft. What impresses employers is not what you do in your course. So you think about something like 340, every person who does a CS degree writes a compiler. So posting your open source compiler says nothing, right? What do you think impresses employers? Outside projects, doing something that you're not required to do, right? You're, you will graduate with a piece of paper that says you got passing grades in all these courses. So they know you did stuff in your courses. What they want to know is what are you doing on top of that, right? And it could be anything. It could be something silly, like, I and mean, that's how I got my um, Microsoft job, is I created this website. Anybody use Woot? Woot.com? It's this website that uh, would sell one item at like midnight, it would release it, and they'd have limited quantities, it would be super cheap. So I, wrote a rep I created a website called Woot Watchers that would watch that and then send you a text message when the thing changed so you could know to go buy it and if you wanted to buy it. And I got about a thousand-ish users, which is not crazy, but it was fun for me like in my room in college. So, um, so and that was enough to like show the Microsoft people that I like, like this is what I love doing. Like I, I did this little thing and I created it all in Ruby on Rails and ran it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, how did I get, I, that's a good question. I posted a bit in like a Woot forum, I think, that, and then, I don't know, just kind of like people would use it, like, I don't know, I'm very much not a marketing or graphics design person, as maybe you can tell from my websites. Um, <laughs> so I just keep it super simple. Um, the funny story about Woot Watchers is that I would get because so Woot would, it would be like a once a day thing and then they'd have a Woot off where they would sell an item as soon as it sells out, they'd sell a new item and a new item. And so my thing would just go crazy sending people text messages. Uh, and so I got very ang angry emails from a couple people being like, you're ruining, you're using all of my text messages. Like I'm gonna sue you for all this data usage. <laughs> I'm like, I'm a broke college kid. Like what are you gonna do? Like, like I'm sorry man, you can disable it. Like it's not my, it's not my fault. And this was back in you know, 2006, 2007, basically pre-smartphone era, so it was all like SMS stuff. So anyways, but it was fun. It was a cool thing to just do for fun. I, just because I wanted to learn Ruby on Rails, that was the only reason why I did it. Okay, so now we have fun. No plagiarism, no cheating. Okay, uh, can update stuff. That's it, any questions on course logistics? We've still got. 25 minutes, we can jump into some material. Yes? What's your definition of reasonable advance notice? Four to six days? Of the syllabus? Yes. I'm gonna update it with, uh, that's just a clause in there to kind of cover me if anything happens, yeah. but that would be like, I mean, it's tricky to say, right? Because four to six days advance notice of what, right? Like if I, for some reason, decided to change the percentage of grade distribution between homework, like that's something I would do like in the next few days and then tell you about it. Doing that like a month, even a month before the end of the course, before the drop date would be not okay. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, reasonable things. Like the only things here I'm gonna change are about, um, like I won't change these thresholds, like I said. I definitely wouldn't change this grading thing. Just adding uh, the course mailing list on here. So, yeah, it, it definitely not gonna change substantially. Yes. Wait, wait, say that again? Oh, oh, yeah. So um, maybe I can go back to the slides. Yeah, yeah. So let's see. Is he in this picture? Yeah, you can barely see him. So this guy here, uh, Will Robertson, who's a professor at Northeastern University. Um, he was part of the Shellfish team that won DEF CON CTF that year, so he has a black badge, so he has free entry to DEF CON for, for life. So I have not, I've not won yet, but I've also not lost, so that's nice. <laughs> and ASU te ASU's team has yet to qualify, but they're working hard. Cool. Oh, I forgot I talked about that, so thank you. All right, 
anything else? Let's jump. Oh, oh, oh. Let's jump. Oh, you can't see it on here. Okay, I'm going to briefly do exactly what I did over there. So this is Will Robertson's on the video. You can see him. And let's do overview. Cool. Okay. So now we begin. So what is security? Right? We're all here because you're taking a course on you say cybersecurity, information security. But what is security? Yeah. It's keeping somebody from hacking your uh, your phone account. Okay, and keeping somebody from hacking your phone account? Why are you worried about your phone? account? Say that again? <laughs> And then using your number to have text messages sent to your uh, that new phone number to hack your bank account. Yeah, that's so actually a big problem nowadays. That's how people break into Coinbase accounts and steal bitcoins. That happened two days ago. Yeah, on Monday. Oh snap! Uh, that sucks. I'm sorry. <laughs> yes. I can't hear you. You have to speak up. Threat identification. Threat identification. What do you mean by threat identification? So identifying threats that can occur that'll take down your system. What else? Yeah. Making sure the system works exactly as intended to. Ooh, making sure the system works exactly as intended to. Do you all do that with your systems that you build? Try to. Ooh, you try to. Yeah, your course assignments, are you trying to make them work exactly as they're supposed to? Does anyone ever write a bug? Yeah, unintentionally. Yeah, so it's kind of clear to see why we have security problems, right? We have humans writing software. Humans are imperfect. Systems are very complex. And so all it takes sometimes is one bug in order to crumble the entire system. Yeah? Uh, keeping information uh, confidential, so only those who need to see it can see it. Mm, okay, so keeping information confidential in the sense that only somebody that should see it can see it. Who defines who can see it? Is, can I define it? I guess it's between the, the user and the service provider. Yeah. yeah, so it kind of depends, right? It depends on the situation we're talking about, right? Like can Apple, so anybody with an iPhone, are you cool with Apple just unlocking your phone at any time and browsing through it? They're fun. <laughs> they built it. Yeah. Whoever owns the information. Ooh. Anybody ever? Well. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah. So the person who owns the information figures out who should be able to access it or not. What about? Think about. Um, we'll talk a lot about different contexts here. So some of the contexts will be like a private business. Some of the contexts will be like national security issues, right? So. Think about a intelligence officer writing a report for the government about a, let's say, a terrorist threat or a terrorist plot in progress. Should that, so who created that information? The officer, right? They're the ones writing down this information. Should they be able to decide who gets that information? Can they say, ah, oh, the public should get this information, or the president shouldn't get this information, right? So it's even a difficult thing to think about it. Even the person who originates the information maybe shouldn't control who can access it. But that's, so we'll separate that a little bit. So okay, we have, so confidentiality. So is, com is there a general form of, let's say, confidentiality? Like, can you just say, yeah. Social uh, confidentiality, like physical confidentiality. I yeah. like it. I mean, and there's also like but there are places where that's not the case. There is. This is there not is. one of them? <laughs> <laughs> there is, but there, they're also designated as those places. Yes. So that's sort of like a, uh, also a security thing. Like, mm -hmm. you can't wander around naked everywhere, but in that specific place, you can. Interesting. Okay, cool. Awesome. So, okay, so, so confidentiality, let's say uh, keeping private information private, right? And we'll, 
We'll delay the who decides what information should or shouldn't be private. Um, so we can say maybe some things. So what are some things that you would like to keep confidential, personally? And you don't have to share what they are. <laughs> Nobody started like reading off your social security number. Yeah. Your bank account number. Why is your bank account number confidential? Or why would you like it to be confidential? It has your money. So anyone who has your bank account number, do you guys know this? If you have a check, right? You know how you transfer money between accounts? You put in the, the bank number, and then the, the routing number, and then the account number, and that's all you need to transfer money from that account? Yeah, it's crazy. Have you else even seen a check? <laughs> Sorry. Sometimes I have to do these checks, the like self checks to see if my references make sense. Yes. Uh, passwords. Passwords. So why do you want to keep your passwords confidential? Uh, I don't want someone to send emails from my ASU account to professors or something. Yeah. Or to log into the grading system of ASU and be able to change their grades. Right. So yeah. So so those kind of things confidential. What else? Keeping, ooh, wait, wait, let's stick with confidential. Is confidential the same thing as keeping information accurate? Uh, no. No. Because you could keep something private but not care about whether it's exactly. accurate or not. Yeah. Go over here. Yeah. Are you sure intended boundaries are well defined? So wait, let's stick with, I want more confidential examples from your life, oh, from medical you. Medical history. What was that? Medical history. Medical history. Yeah. You may not want somebody to know what kind of medical issues you may have. You may not want your insurance company in particular to know what kind of stuff. Yeah. I don't want anybody to know what I've been purchasing with my money. Purchasing, yeah, purchase history. Why not? What are you worried about? What do you got to hide? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. In general, right? So you can build a very comprehensive model of a person based on their purchases, right? You could see what they like, what they do, where they go, what kind of things they're into, um, which might may be revealing even more information about you than you're comfortable sharing. There's a hand in the back. Okay. Are you still asking no, what is, we're focusing more on confidentiality here. So like, what are some things that you would prefer to be confidential? Yeah. Private communications. Private communications. So text messages, um, I don't know, what chat clients do people use? Like WhatsApp, Signal, Slack. What was it? Discord. Discord. Okay. What was that Slack? Oh, Slack's a good one. Yeah, you know there's, uh, for Slacks, the owner of the Slack can get a data dump of the entire Slack, including private messages. Interesting. Yeah, interesting. You've got to read those <laughs> privacy policies and see what they can do. Now, the, now they, let's see, I can't remember what, it used to be that it would alert everyone in the Slack that that was going to happen. Now I think they can do it, but they need to write a lit, written letter to get the data dump of that. So think about how that affects people using their company's corporate Slacks that are doing things through private messages. Yeah. That, you guys? Uh, name and address. Name and address. Why is your name and address? Would you want to keep confidential? Uh, you don't like to know where you live. Well, that gets into a little bit of right? You may not want people to know where you live. You may not want people to know where to, I don't know, ship weird things to. Yes. Okay. You got it now? Your social security number. Social security number. So why your social security, blah, blah, blah. why not your social security number? What can you do with somebody's social security number? What kinds of lots? Certificate. What was that? File a death, death certificate. Yeah. So you're. So you, that would be very difficult. What else? Yeah. Your your exact location. Your exact location. Ooh, your GPS location. Okay, let's go back to Social Security for a second, because it's. I was actually surprised, and I didn't, never realized. I always knew it was confidential, but realizing all the things you can do with it. Yeah. Um, they can also apply for jobs. Yep. Jobs, which could be cool, if, but you're not getting any of that money. <laughs> Passports, what about credit cards, <coughs> loans, they can get loans in your name that you're now on the hook for and affect your credit score that you have to go through hoops to fight. Yeah, all this kind of stuff. So, okay, um, pictures you take on your phone, maybe? Nobody mentioned that? Right, so these are all kind of interesting things um, that we talk about there. So confidentiality, so there's kind of three main things we talk about when we talk about what is security, what do we mean? There's three different aspects. The first one is confidentiality like we talked about, right? So making sure that 
depending on whoever's system or whatever it is, that private things stay private, right? And as well, one of the themes as we'll get into is this is very, let's say, context sensitive in the sense that it depends on what system you're talking about, about what things are confidential. And in different contexts, different things may be confidential or they may not be. Cool. So what else? So what are some other thing, aspects of security that aren't necessarily confidentiality? Yes. Uh, I, don't, I don't know what the word is, but you don't want people to be able to like alter your files. I know that NHS, Why not? like the NHS, had like a problem with ransomware, mm. and all their files got blocked, and that caused a lot of delays with patients. Yeah. So, so having people not be able to alter your files, and why is that? So we'll call that. We'll call that integrity, right? So making sure that the data is what you thought it was and the data doesn't change. So but why is that different from confidentiality? Yeah. Um, it's different from confidentiality because like, you're trying to make sure that it's not only accurate, mm -hmm. but that um, if the situation changes, you can update it and rearrange it so that way it's actually factual. Mm -hmm. OK, so uh, the main difference is the f is in, let's say, so I guess if we're concerned about integrity, are we necessarily also concerned about confidentiality? No, why not? Let me give me a, a counter example. Yeah. Somebody could just delete the data. So they didn't mm. learn what's in it, but it's not there anymore. That's still a security Right, so that would be a problem if we had some secret data that somebody was able to delete, right? So, and then now we no longer have access. Yeah. Or if it's like a public site with open source code, mm -hmm. we might not care too much if someone can take a look at that, but if they all of a sudden put something in there that steals people's data. Right, so think about like the Linux kernel, right? The Linux kernel is completely open source. There is absolutely zero confidentiality <coughs> requirements from the Linux source code, but not everyone can just write to it and change it because you could easily introduce a back door to allow you access to anybody's Linux machine, which would be a huge, huge deal. Yeah. Right, so this actually goes, one of the recent trends now is a public website that will, uh, obviously a public website is by nature not confidential. Do we agree? If you can go to your browser and go to cnn.com or whatever, that is fundamentally not confidential, right? You're seeing at least that, that public facing page, right? They may have admin interfaces that they want to keep secret, but that front facing page is not confidential. Now. What if somebody goes in and changes CNN.com's front page or some other page's front page to put in a snippet of JavaScript code that mines Bitcoin in everyone's browser that visits that page? Right? So now, and which is, this actually happens. If you look up, I can't remember where the recent thing was, but this is, uh, it's called crypto jacking. Is that the right term? I think. So, so yeah, so here, the confidentiality of the page is still fine. Nobody cares about that. But the integrity of the page has been violated from what the people intended it to be and to what's being sent to people. Um, so yeah, these are all. So what are some other things that you would want to maintain the integrity of in your, let's say, more personal so we can kind of relate to this? I don't think you spoke. Yeah? Uh, maybe transaction history. You might want to keep that same you don't want that randomly change yeah so it, exactly so it depends on you know what your bank account status is if you woke up and had an extra couple grand in your account maybe you're not going to scream about it but if you wake up the other way and now there's your account is now in the negative 2000 or whatever that would be a problem because if the bank or whatever can't maintain the integrity of your transactions that'd be a huge problem what else yeah Medical records, that's a huge one, right? So what if somebody was able to change your medical record to say that you're not allergic to something that you are allergic to? And then you go to the hospital and the doctors give you the thing that you're allergic to potentially causing harm. Yeah, I mean, this happens all the time where not even with mistakes like that, but where they end up doing surgery on the wrong limb. Right? And then I think the classic case of this, or I don't know if this is true or not, but the thing that happens is they'll write on, or they'll write no, that's right, they'll write no on somebody's leg, like over and over, and then the doctor will see it and 
think it says on because they'll read it upside down, and so they'll think they're operating on that leg. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right, that's all right. What about like your, you know, like we said with kind of the ransomware example. So what about all your files on your laptops and phones? Like, do you want access to all of the stuff you've done for your courses and all the pictures that you've taken? <coughs> right, so like, if somebody's able to corrupt all of that so that you can't access that now, right, that would be a pretty bad. Although I guess, I guess integrity there is a little bit different, but cool. And so the areas we'll kind of, so, so we'll talk about in, in the course, kind of integrity in terms of uh, how to prevent integrity attacks, how to detect them. Um, and so are there any other, we've, we've kind of touched a little bit around this, but are there any other components of security that don't necessarily fall into confidentiality or integrity? Yeah. Maybe the availability of a service. Availability in what sense? So like a denial of service attack on a, web, on a website or something so that basically the business is down, for right. example. Right, so think about Amazon. <coughs> Does Amazon make a lot of money per second? Yes. Yep. Imagine if you were to, able to take down Amazon.com for like an hour, right? That would have a measurable impact on Amazon's bottom line because people cannot buy their products through them, right? But you're not violating the confidentiality necessarily of Amazon. You're not necessarily violating the integrity because maybe you're not able to change their homepage to be whatever you want. But if I can make it so that it's not available for people that want to use it, then I've actually caused a critical security problem. So, uh, so you can think of this, I always think of this as the CIA triad. This is something you should burn into your brain. This is something that interviewers ask you. But rather than just memorizing confidentiality, integrity, availability, it's actually being able to understand and process each of these things, how they're different, how they relate, um, what are some examples of a system. Because so, I mean, making a system that is incredibly confidential, such that let's say nobody can access it, is fairly easy in some sense, right? I could create a computer, I could put it in a vault that only I know the passcode of, I can station guards that I trust. If I'm the military, I can put people to guard that, right? But it's still not very available. You can't actually access this system. And so security is always a balance between these things, right? You need people to access your system. Otherwise, that in itself is a security concern. You also want the things that need to be confidential, confidential, and maintain integrity on those things that you need. Cool. Questions on this? Wait, is confidentiality uh, not necessarily the same thing as the, uh, the opposite of the ability? Is it? Or? Ooh, interesting. I would say no. So something like, so if we go back to the Linux example, right? The Linux source code is, is not confidential, right? But let's see. If I took away people's access to that, that's not necessarily breaking the confidentiality. That doesn't make any sense. Okay. Not sure what the So I guess the opposite of confidentiality in this case would be basically you don't care who has access to what, which makes sense in something like open source code, which makes sense in, uh, let's say, what's another example here? Uh, open source code. I have another good one in my head. Anybody have any ideas? Public record. Public records, yeah, that's good. That's a good one. Or, I mean, you can think of uh, Bitcoin, like the blockchain is all public, all the transaction history. Um, and so, in that case, you don't care about confidentiality, but you still care about people's access to things, right? So you have basically no confidentiality requirements. Although I guess on another hand, if you're, okay, if your requirement is the opposite of confidentiality, which means everybody has it, then you are kind of concerned with availability. I don't know, I probably won't ask you a question like that since it's very complicated. But the idea is to think through, so be able to take a situation and think about, okay, start thinking about threats, start thinking about if I have, um, like, how can I 
compromise the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of this system, and does that make sense? And what are the business and organizational goals of this system? So you can say, do I care about confidentiality? Then I can get rid of an entire class of attacks that I don't need to worry about because they're not what is important to our business. Okay, what time does this class go to? 15. Okay, that's what I thought. We got three more minutes. Cool. Okay, so what is a threat? Yes? A virus or a bug? A virus or a bug can definitely be a threat. What else? A person? Yeah, a person. How can a person be a threat? I look so nice. <laughs> what? They can hack? They can hack, break into your stuff? You what else can a person do? What was that? Mistakes. A person, people make mistakes all the time, right? And not just necessarily coders, right? You have people, um, let's say if you wanted to get into a store before anybody was there, and somebody stops you and say, hey, the store is closed, like you can't come in here, and you say, oh, no, no, I'm part of the cleaning crew, like we have to come in here, there's a big deal, like my boss told me to come over here, and then they just let you in, right? That was probably a mistake that they made in terms of their access control requirements of the physical space, but, you know, it's people making mistakes. Or what are some other famous things that have happened? I'm not sure, yeah. Sticking a thumb drive into a system you're not supposed to. Oh yeah, this is a great example. So I have this, um, so you talk about people making mistakes. So I heard, um, I can't remember who it was, somebody who worked, I think it was General Schmidl, but I don't know if I should say that out loud. Um, but he was saying that the, so what ended up happening was they found, so you know the military, the US military has their complete own network, completely separate from the US internet, like the, the internet as a whole, it's called Milnet. So they saw outgoing packets from one of the machines in a base to Russia, right? Very bad thing to see. So they start investigating. It turns out what happens is the Russians, like three years earlier, had compromised a bunch of thumb drives and sent them to the like, convenience store that was next to this base and then just waited. And eventually, and so those, you know, people buy those thumb drives, and eventually it took one person to ignore the rules that they weren't allowed to stick an unclassified flash drive into a classified system. They did that, they popped it, and then it went to go talk to home. So this is definitely people in terms of threats. You can have a policy that says you should never plug in a USB thumb drive, but if there are thumb drives and there are USB ports, people are going to plug them in. <laughs> I think we can stop there. Thanks, everyone. That's really good. Thank you.